I will go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Happy Wednesday. I hope that you all are having a great day so far. My name is Nirvana Felix, and I'm the Strategy and Impact Associate at WDN. And I just wanted to thank you all so much for participating in WDN's Impact Investing Series. Today is the second workshop in this series where we're going to be learning everything there is to know about publicly traded portfolios. And a little bit later, we'll have the opportunity to hear from two WDN members about their own impact investing journeys. Um, but until then, I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic to our lovely host, Maggie, to kick, to kick us off with our workshop. <laughs> Thank you, Nirvana. Lovely host that has such a nice ring to it. Good morning. Thank you for joining. Um, my name is Maggie Kulik. I am uh, the chair of the C3 WDN board. Uh, I am also uh, have a day job that involves um, uh, being the CEO and founder of a firm called Chicory Wealth. And um, we are a private wealth uh, advisory firm based in Atlanta. And we specialize in environmental, social and governance investing. So um, I'm gonna start today. And by the way, if you, we are recording, but if you wanna share your camera, it would be lovely because I'm not going to put up any PowerPoints. I'm just not that kind of gal. I just don't do PowerPoints. And I would like um, my 15 or so minutes of this to be interactive. So I'd love to see your faces if you would be so kind. So I'll start by saying one of the cool things about this particular episode in our continuing uh, impact series is that um, I would venture to say that there is likely no one on the call that doesn't own publicly traded investments. Some of you may have never invested in a community development financial institution, and you may never have invested in what we'll get to later on namely, you know, things like alternative non-publicly traded investments, venture capital, things of the like. But I am pretty confident that everyone who is on this call has some money in publicly traded stocks. And if there is anyone out there who doesn't, cool, let, let us know that. So that would be, be interesting to hear if that is in fact a bad assumption. I want to sort of set the table today for our conversation with our two members who graciously agreed to be interviewed um, during this session. Um, to just talk for a moment about um, um, considering what some of these terms mean like ESG and SRI and various acronyms. Um, and, but begin with uh, just the concept of why, why one invests in publicly traded securities at all. Why bother to do that? Why not just either only invest in direct investments or community investments or keep your money in cash or whatever the case may be? So just at a very high level, um, why public at all? Why do that? Um, I would say the number one reason is uh, besides habit and perhaps acculturation for some of us or maybe even heritage for some of us, um, it's because uh, publicly traded stocks are highly liquid. If you own uh, shares in a company that is, ex that is traded on the public exchange and uh, you need that money, whatever its value is, you can either go online yourself or call up your advisor. And from the moment you give the order to usually one or at the most two days, you have cash in your account that you can then extract. So one of the things that, one of the hallmarks and one of the reasons people invest in public portfolios, besides the idea that they hope the value of their holdings goes up over time, is that it's highly liquid. It's easily accessible. Um, it tends to be, over time, historically, stable. Now, those of you who pay any attention to public markets, especially in the last few weeks will say, are you kidding me, Maggie? What do you mean stable? There's nothing, there's nothing at all stable about our public markets. And we could have a much longer conversation about the underlying stability or lack thereof of our entire financial system. 
I will just say that over the course of the last 70 or so years, and maybe more, uh, value the value of most publicly traded securities or broad swaths of the market have gone up and that, uh, that it is still considered relatively stable. Stable meaning you're likely to be able to get your money out when you want to get your money out. Are you gonna be able to get it out at the exact value you want? Maybe not, but it's liquid to you. Uh, unlike, and I'm contrasting that with some of the things we'll talk about later in our series, alternative investments or direct investments one of the hallmarks of which is illiquidity. You have a long, much longer term commitment in terms of tie up of the money than you do in publicly traded securities. So how do you invest in publicly traded securities? What are the various vehicles? And specifically, what are the various vehicles relative to these metrics we're calling impact or ESG, which stands for environmental, social, and governance metrics? And how does that relate to something like a term like socially responsible investing? Um, <clears throat> so let's start with, and, and by the way, I should have said this at the beginning, I'm trying to, I'm really trying to run a no jargon presentation here. So if I say anything at all that you're like, I didn't, you just lost me. I, I don't, I don't know where we're at here. Please post it up in the chat and I will back it up because I want this to be as intelligible as possible. Uh, and I know some of you are probably very sophisticated investors and some of you may be beginners. So I'm trying to strike, I'm, I'm trying to it sort of go from the very basics here. Um, so if you opened up your uh, statement from who, wherever it is your money lives, um, perhaps Fidelity or Schwab um, or Pershing or Cambridge, you would open up your portfolio and you might see a variety of different names inside of there. Some of which you might recognize, some of you may have portfolios of actually just individual stocks, you know, um, Microsoft, Apple, etc. I would wager that many of you would be invested in what are referred to as mutual funds, right? And if you are invested in uh, mutual funds, that think of themselves as ESG mutual funds or socially responsible mutual funds, there'll be something like that in the name, right? So what's a mutual fund? A mutual fund is a pool of stocks and run by some manager. There is an Oz behind the curtain in the fund who is choosing the individual holdings that go into the fund. And those funds might have as few as 50 stocks in them, or they might have as many as a few hundred stocks in them. But they are, if you are an owner of a mutual fund, you are an owner of the fund, not actually the stocks in the fund. So what, why that matters, for example, and we'll talk about this a little later, is one of the advantages of owning, say, individual stocks in some form or fashion, is that if you, choose to engage in something like shareholder activism, where you are wanting a company to change its behavior. If you own a mutual fund, you do not have the rights to engage in that process or through or, or actually engage in the voting of the proxies. You've ceded that responsibility uh, and uh, uh, decision-making to whoever the fund manager is. Mutual funds are also characterized by, there's the, there's the holdings that they have inside of them, but they tend to be somewhat opaque. Um, you, you cannot in any given moment, click on a mutual fund and see all of the holdings inside of it. It's always, there's always a time delay in terms of when those fund managers must, must post up what's actually being held inside the fund. Um, so you might be able to see what they held a month ago, but you can't see what they're holding in real time. Um, why does that matter? Well, I mean, or why do they do it that way? In part, they do it that way because fund managers often do not wish to reveal to other fund managers what they're actually holding. It's by definition somewhat opaque, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So um, what that means in the world of environmental, social, and governance metrics um, is that 
it would not be surprising to me if you own a mutual fund that calls itself an ESG fund that you might open it up and you might look at it, the top 10 holdings and you might see a company in there and you'd go, what? Gosh, that surprises me. I wouldn't think that company would be in this fund. So, um, so let's step back and talk about what ESG means. It, and it means a lot of different things to different people, which is part of, it's a very contested term, I would argue, and it's going to continue to be more contested as time goes on. What is real ESG versus uh, fakery or greenwashing in the financial services industry? I think that's a big question. But technically, environmental, social, and governance metrics measure um, the, the companies. It can measure, it, there's an enormity of things that gets measured, but at a very high level, environmental impact, so carbon footprint, but also in the E side, how much does this company or could this company either benefit from or be harmed by a... Um, uh, advances in legislation, for example, clean air acts, opportunities in clean tech, et cetera, et cetera. And there, there's measurements for that. The S is broadly speaking stakeholders. So how, do, how does the company treat its employees? How does it, what's its supply chain look like? Um, are they, for example, using prison labor? Um, are they well developing their human capital? how much of the company's success depends on human capital. And governance metrics, again, broadly speaking, relate to how, um, how the company is governed vis-a-vis governed -vis its board of directors, uh, how diverse is its board, um, how, how there's a term they refer to, I love this term, overboarded, is it? Overboarded meaning, is, this, are, is their board composed of people who are sitting on 15 other boards, such that what you have is this sort of small universe of, you know, board members, wherein it makes it very easy to engage in a certain amount of self-dealing across uh, companies. Is the CEO and the board of, uh, and the board chair the same person and thus implicitly in a conflict, or is that separated, right? So all of these metrics uh, are, um, are used for evaluating an ESG score. Um, and, uh, and this theoretically is what goes into creating a portfolio, at, let's just say at a mutual fund level, um, where you are purporting to have a, a high ESG or an ESG oriented fund. Um, so mutual fund, one type of vehicle, you could use the same kind of metrics for another kind of vehicle, like an exchange traded fund. What is an exchange traded fund? It's a pool of individual stocks. Uh, what, what distinguishes it from a, uh, a mutual fund is that it is in no way really actively managed. The stocks are selected and left from some pool that could be reflective of say the S&P 500, largest 500, publicly traded companies in the US. Um, and it's transparent. You can see, if you click on an ETF, you can see every single stock held in that ETF, that exchange traded fund. And it trades throughout the day like an individual stock. Again, exchange traded funds tend to have very large amounts of holdings. You would not be surprising for you to pull up an ETF that called itself an ESG ETF and you might see mm, 600 holdings. And you would look there and you would go, huh, I'm sort of surprised that that <laughs> company is inside there, right? Um, but it would, how that particular ETF was constructed would very much depend on who sponsored it, who created it, and how tight or loose their restrictions were for how it was constructed. What's the, why might someone invest in an exchange traded fund rather than a mutual fund? They are cheaper. As I mentioned, the mutual fund has a kind of Oz behind the curtain. Oz needs to get paid. Oz doesn't do their work for free. Uh, an exchange traded fund typically is just has a much lower internal cost 
to very passive holding. And they started years and years ago. And some of you may have like a Russell 1000 in your portfolio that's not screened for anything. It's just the thousand largest companies uh, traded in the US, for example. And then there are, some of you might own, something called a separately managed account, an SMA. And if you own an SMA, what you're owning is instead of um, a very large pool of stocks, it's usually a relatively small pool of stocks, 50, 60. Um, it is managed by someone, kind of like a mutual fund manager, except it is completely transparent. And it might even appear to you as, as individual companies. But again, in an SMA, if you're a participant in a separately managed account and you're seeing individual companies on your portfolio, and you might see it and you might be invested in a, an SMA that is in fact, calls itself and is in fact either socially responsible, I'll get to the difference between ESG and that in just a second, or environmental, social and governance. Um, there is a manager of that SMA. And again, in the context of shareholder activism, for example, or voting proxies, it is the manager of the separately managed account who would vote the proxies. Typically, individual shareholders who are participants in or own a separately managed account do not typically vote the proxies. Um, normally, that's given over to, uh, to, the, to the manager of the fund. Why would someone own a separately managed account? Well, it's individual stocks. It's completely transparent. Um, it's more expensive than an exchange traded fund. Internal costs, because again, you've got a manager and that manager wants to get paid. Um, and, but it can be uh, highly customizable. So perhaps you own a, an example of a, an SMA that has been in the environmental, social, and governance space for a long time is Trillium. Some of you may know Trillium, that trade name. So, um, you know, a, a Trillium SMA can be customizable. You could open up the portfolio and you could see something in it and you'd be like, I'm not sure I really wanna be owning this. And Trillium might agree for your portfolio to pull that position out. Um, they're only gonna agree so much because they've got an agenda, right? And they've got their own ideas of what could happen. I mean, if you started saying, I want 15 of these stocks gone, I'm sure Trillium would politely ask you to get out of their SMA, but it's customizable within a certain range. Um, and then there is, gotta be careful of my time. We could go on and on. A thing called direct indexing. And this has become very, very popular, in, uh, especially in this space of eliminating certain companies based on environmental, social, and governance metrics. So you start with, you might go to someone um, who uses uh, a technology partner who does direct indexing. And they might say, we're going to start with a universe of stocks. And the universe might be that we'll use the S&P 500. We're gonna use the S&P 500 and we're gonna to say to you as a client, tell us what you mostly care about and what you mostly wanna avoid. And you might say, I don't want any oil companies in my portfolio. I don't want any tobacco companies in my portfolio. And I don't want any uh, companies that use prison labor. And they would plug that into their software and they would run a um, kind of overlay of the S&P 500 and any stock that had below a certain measurement on those metrics would be eliminated from that pool of stocks and you'd get what was left. And there might be out of 500, 300 um, or 250. And of course, the more overlays you lay, the the smaller and smaller the pool gets, right? Um, the idea behind direct indexing is it's based on the idea that what the client really wants is to do as well as some index, the S&P 500. They do not wish to underperform, but they wanna eliminate a certain amount of stocks. And so by, by use of analytics, they can go, oh, okay, well, here's how likely this portfolio is to track to the S&P 500. 
Okay. You with me so far? Just those of you on camera, just either nod your head. Or could, okay. All right. Good. All right. So um, I could talk a lot about what I think is wrong with all that stuff, <laughs> but we don't have time for me to do that. We're going to move on, but I will just say that these are the, and I will just say the very last way you can invest is you can have a manager who picks specific individual stocks based on a certain criteria and you end up holding maybe 40 or 50 stocks, period. Um, uh, which is a little like a separately managed account, right? Um, but you're owning those directly uh, and as a shareholder, you can participate in shareholder activism. I'll just say one last thing and then we'll start talking to about ex the experience of moving portfolios around with, um, with our friends, Linda and Laura, but how does socially responsible investing relate to ESG, right? So ESG, environmental social governance is just, just very broad uh, series of metrics and it depends on where the information is coming from as to how I would argue how trustworthy the information is. Um, there are numerous databases out, out there. The MSC ESG database is one. It is reliant on corporate reporting, which immediately creates suspicion. Um, we operate at WDN with the hermeneutics of suspicion. I think we would all agree. So when you're reliant on corporate reporting, there's a level of suspicion. Um, there are other now recently, I recently demoed some software that's just amazing that is pulling data from NGOs, the SEC, and a whole range of things that is not reliant on corporate reporting, which is something we've just started using because of the issues associated with corporate reporting. But ESG, in an ESG portfolio, you could just as easily have, you could wind up in your portfolio with the best of the worst of a sector. So you might end up with the best oil company out of a whole lot of terrible oil companies, right? An SRI, a socially responsible overlay, tends to exclude whole swaths of the market in, in, in very broad terms based on the individual um, or the entities, the, the fund manager or the advisor's own lights. And so, you know, you're not going to invest in anything that is manufacturing weapons of war, for example, potentially, or no tobacco companies at all, not just the tobacco companies that are trying to produce tobacco that might be a little less dangerous or something, right? So in general, SRI is this tighter subset of this broader environmental, social, and governance universe. Um, and this is part, this again is as we're seeing the proliferation of funds and ETFs that are calling themselves ESG or calling themselves SRI, et cetera, you know, it's, it's, it, these are relative terms. Um, and, you know, I think that as investors, you want to get real clear or as clear as you possibly can about what's buried under the hood to the extent that you're owning vehicles that are less transparent than others. All right, I went over, sorry. I could get, obviously, <laughs> I could go on and on. I'm gonna stop uh, and we're gonna turn it over to, we're gonna ask Laura and Linda to come off mute. Hi. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for being willing to, uh, to talk to us this morning. And um, I'll just say again, folks, as we get talking, if you've, uh, questions for me or questions for Laura and Linda. I hope you will put them in the chat and we'll have, I think we'll have a few minutes towards the end for um, opening it up to as well. So um, let's, uh, let's just start by asking you each to introduce yourself a little bit about your length of time here with WDN, whatever involvement you've had, et cetera, et cetera. So um, Linda, you want to start? Sure. Um, I have been a member for nine years. And I'm currently on the board of directors. I'm starting my fourth year. And I have been involved in, uh, over the last nine years in some of the circles and the um, impact collectives. And um, yeah, so that's me. <laughs> and I have been a member since 2019. I joined when I attended the conference with my mom. And I am a current member of the Safe and Sustainable Steering Committee. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you so much. 
And Linda, thank you especially for, I've been working with you on the board and you've just been doing all this work around our governance practices. So again, every time I see Linda, I say thank you because it's just such hard work. So thank you <laughs> very much. Thank you, um, so you guys, when we when we put our little thing on the listserv and said, you know, if you've been involved in making some changes in your portfolio, raise your hand, would you be willing to talk to us? You guys raised your hand. So well, let's just start with um, how long ago you began to tune into what was going on in your publicly traded portfolios and when you started making those changes and what was the motivation? And whoever wishes to go first is okay with me, so. Okay, I'm, I can go first. <laughs> so um, I started this journey about 20 years ago and it was a point where our um, assets had reached a point where we didn't, we needed somebody to help us manage them. And so we um, found a firm and a advisor that we liked and um, they started, um, we started making a plan. And uh, so I have, a, I have a healthcare background. So the first thing I said was, I don't want any of our investments in tobacco or firearms. And um, I was basically told, well, that's, and, and maybe it's maybe 20 years ago, there weren't as many options, but I was basically told that wasn't a good idea. Um, that uh, our, our, the performance would be significantly less. And so um, just, I really re met a, a lot of resistance. And so over the next 10 years, as that firm merged with another firm and we uh, periodically had a new, a new advisor that uh, we were working with, I always asked that same question. And I always got the same answer until about, um, so for about the first 10 years, and then uh, we finally got an advisor and I asked the question and I said, you can do that. And she said, you can do that. And um, so we took one of our IRAs and put it into Boston Common. Um, that, that advisor left the firm and a, a couple of years later, 2014, we followed her and moved all of our investments over to a firm called Caprock. And so the first thing that we did was um, all of our um, publicly traded securities were moved into a, a period, which um, I'm not sure exactly um, how you would term them, Maggie, but, uh, and so the first thing we did was uh, say, okay, what, what do we want our portfolio to look like? And we went through a process of interviews and filling out um, questionnaires and, um, we ended up uh, moving, we, we basically were able to exclude uh, companies that um, worked on fossil fuels, mining, tobacco, firearms, military weapons, nuclear weapons. And then we also had some um, specific, at that time, specific companies we didn't want, like Halliburton and Murdoch Communications, those types of things. So, um, and so, you know, when you do that, we'd had these stocks removed and they had been, you know, gaining, um, you know, they, they had, the value had really gone up. And, and so it was, you know, a question of how much do you actually exclude and move out? And we, we did a pretty, we did a pretty good chunk of that. And, and we moved some of that into our donor advice fund and some of it, we just took a tax hit. Um, and so Aperio also does, so it's all individual stocks and, so they also do um, the, ES, the ESG weighting. And so um, I think as new stocks are added, uh, decisions about which ones you know, we ex exclude, you know, they always take that into consideration. Um, we have a, a high weighting on, social, on the social um, part of it. And then next is the environment. Um, the other the other thing that we're able to do, as you mentioned, Maggie, is to participate in uh, shareholder advocacy, and so they partner um, Caprock partners with um, As You Sow, and so in the fall of 2020 and winter of 2021, we actually were able to participate in 40 over 46, I think, different shareholder. Uh, advocacy pieces. And that's, uh, unfortunately, that's changing. It, it's, it's getting a little more complicated, I think, to work with. Um, as you saw, there's some new regulations and um, 
that have come around. So we're we're uh, we'll continue to do that. But um, so then the other um, the other thing that's been really good for me is that um, when something comes up, uh, like the Parkland shootings, and um, I'm able to contact my advisor and say, you know, do and we we have a limit eliminated, um, you know. Um, weapons from our portfolio but there's there's so many other ways um that you can look at it so we contact them and said you know what about retail sales what about dick sporting goods what about walmart that sell guns and and fortunately we didn't have um we didn't have any stocks uh, in those companies so and we also asked as you sell are you doing anything uh as far as shareholder advocacy goes and um so yeah, so we, uh, our portfolio, um, I guess, is it, I don't know if it's comparing it to the Russell 3000 or it's stocks in the Russell 3000. Um, and, but since inception, um, our portfolio has actually outperformed the Russell 3000 by 36% or an average of 2.4% a year. So, I mean, it's been a win-win, I think all around. And that so and you know stocks are not the only thing in our portfolio. Obviously, we have fixed income, you know, kind of the traditional, but we also have are moving more and more, have a pretty significant chunk in um, alternative investments and, and what we call impact investments, and and all of that um, is intentional. And, and you know, we invest. It may not be a classic impact uh, investment, but. Um, it's things like affordable housing and my, you know, my loans to low middle income families or uh, supply chain management for solar and wind and, and those types of things. And so, yeah, that's kind of where we're at. Mm -hmm. Kind of wishing I went first because my mom is so much more involved than I am. I started, I started thinking about this in about 2014 when my youngest was two months old. And we, so we'd been with a financial advisor. Most of the money that I have in investments is money that I inherited from my folks. And so we, um, I, I was working with a financial advisor that they'd been using in Seattle. And I knew my mom had been doing socially responsible investing and impact investing. So I would, every time I talked to the advisor, he'd want to like talk about the performance of my portfolio and I would want to talk about impact investing. And so it was, I never, he wanted to go in detail through my performance reports. And I would just ask him, you know, I, I'm not actually interested in that. I can read the report, but what, could, any, could we transition anything over to something that is more socially responsible? And his response was always, well, we've looked into the funds that are available and we just don't feel like we can recommend them. And so over time, I would continue to ask and I would continue to get that response. Um, they, 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 I otherwise really liked them and they were really kind of nimble and helpful in 2014 when we bought our house here in Albany, California. And so at that time, I'd already reached out to um, an impact investing firm in San Francisco, Veris, they're a B Corp and, and female run. And I really liked them. We'd had a really great conversation with them, but because the Seattle people had helped us like get our house in kind of a significant way, um, I stuck with them for a number of years after that and probably shouldn't have. But in 2017, I reached back out to Veris. They were very surprised to hear from me so many years later, but, and that was when we decided to do the switch. And I told my advisor at the firm in Seattle and he was like, yeah, we'd had, we'd been doing like meetings around and I'd been asked if any of my clients were sort of possibly leaving. And I said, and he had indicated that I was very likely to leave if they couldn't offer more substantial impact investing opportunities. And so he wasn't surprised at all. But so we joined down with Veris. They had us do a survey around our kind of investment priorities, screening requirements. And then they just came up with their portfolio. And I didn't, I didn't ask a lot of questions, honestly. I had a baby and a toddler, and um, I, we've just kind of gone with what their recommendations have been. Um, there, I mean, what Maggie was talking about, we have part, there's a significant chunk in the tr a Trillium large cap stock, which has just the ESG screening. And as Maggie was saying, you look into it and you see companies like Deere and Company, like John Deere, right? And um, Procter and Gamble are in there. So maybe it's just the, the best of the worst in certain sectors. Um, but that's one part of it. But then there's some money in um, like a community loan fund 
which is just it's a three year loan that renews each three years and it has a 1.5% return on the investment and they do loans to nonprofits and to people in communities that have historically had um, been subject to discriminatory loan discriminatory loan practices so yeah there's I mean I feel like there's some things in the portfolio that are doing more good than others but I've taken a just because of my stage in life I've taken a very like set it and forget it approach and, and deferred a lot to my financial advisor on on what's in the portfolio and similar to my, my we haven't outperformed the benchmarks that we're tracking but we have performed in line with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So um, uh, you both have mentioned some of the hurdles you had to overcome, the first of which was a kind of um, early on advisor passivity to this. Um, and um, Linda, you mentioned specifically tax issues associated with particularly, you know, if you have money in the after tax space, that can be onerous. And you got around mm -hmm. some of that by or helped yourself some of it by transferring some of those stocks into a donor advised fund, I gather, and that helped offset some things. Were there other things? Um, are there other things that you, as you experienced this, that you wish you had either, maybe, maybe, maybe not you done differently, but wished was different about this? I mean, I appreciate the stage of life piece completely, Laura. I mean, we only, we only have so much bandwidth and you can't be an expert in everything. And at some point you got to trust somebody and that can become difficult um, and even problematic. But I'm just curious if there are other, other uh, I guess, advice you might offer to anyone who might be at the beginning of this journey of looking hard at their own portfolio and maybe feeling a little overwhelmed. Yeah. You know, what I would say is, um, I mean, just being on this, this session, I think, and here and, and learning about all the opportunities and options out there for investments. Um, it, it would have been really helpful, I think, 20 years ago, if I had I really had no interest in, in really being actively working on our financials uh, as an individual. Um, if I had maybe done, um, and I think my husband probably had, but done more research and learning around it before I actually uh, picked it, picked uh, an advisor. Um, I think that that would have been good. And even if there hadn't been more options available at that time, um, at least I would have known what to ask, done a better job knowing what to ask and, um, and been able to kind of, and I think, I think I did, I think, you know, I really, I never abandoned my original intent. In fact, I think, um, you know, obviously just originally it was just two things that I wanted not to invest in. But uh, by the time I was able to do it, I, you know, I, there were a lot more things that I did not want my money invested in. So, um, so that was good. But I think I found, um, you know, once I found the right person, once I had the person that said, um, you can do that, you know, <laughs> so then, then I feel like I'm really happy with where we're at. And, um, you know, I, and I think, you know, I kind of, I can always ask questions. Anytime I have a question, um, it's really easy to call up or to email and, and get the response. I guess the one thing that I would, um, probably, and I think we're starting to do this more is more of an intention more of an intention with a focus on women and BIPOC communities, which, um, so yeah, that's kind of a goal. Now I'm energized to focus on that more with my investments too. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I, I, I realized that you can, you, you don't have to do it all at once. It's something that you can do over time and you can transition your investments to the extent that, you know, if you don't, if you have a lot of capital gains and it would be a huge hit for you to have to sell off um, kind of some legacy mutual funds or whatever's in your portfolio. It's something that you can do over time. And there's, if that's something you're really concerned about, there's like strategic ways to sort of offset it with losses or as my mom did move money into a donor advised fund. So I think I just, I felt like a little pressure to kind of transition it all at once, but Varys has actually advised me in a way that we, we kind of did it slowly over time that it didn't feel as dramatic as I thought it was going to be when we did it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you mentioned, Linda, that um, uh, around how over time your, the things you wanted to make sure you either emphasized or excluded has grown, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing that I've found interesting, um, you know, as someone who is a, 
someone who works with clients and demo some of the softwares that get used out there. One of the things, that the term that always comes to mind is, is the term we use here at WDN and in lots of places is this notion of intersectionality. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, the software set up as if people were issued, were only interested in siloed issue areas, mm -hmm. right? You know, but I can't, I, I mean, very few people are like, you know, I love tobacco companies, but mm -hmm. I certainly <laughs> don't want anything to do with, you know, handguns or, you know what I mean? That kind of like that, that weird. So um, I do think there is this, um, especially as your awareness increases and you begin aware that you become aware that you can um, uh, look deeper at some of these things. It, it, the pool of possible investments, I would argue, does in fact get smaller. Um, mm -hmm. That said, um, one of the things I say to my clients is you, you really cannot invest in the public markets and do no harm. Mm -hmm. You just, I mean, we live in global capitalism. It's not gonna happen. There's gonna be some harm. But I would argue you can do significantly less harm. And, um, you know, perfection is the enemy of the good. So any eye on these things, you know, so when I, when I talk about mutual funds and what's under the hood, and if I sound critical, and I am, okay, I'll cop to that, I am critical. But I do think that um, for those of you out there who may be at the beginning of the journey or who own funds um, that, you know, you understand to be SRI, but you're not quite sure, I don't want to send the message that like, you've done it wrong or something. That is not at all what I'm saying. I just think that as, as people, as members of WDN, we're, we're critically concerned with making serious change in the world. And we're all you know, laser focused on how we do that in relationship to moving money philanthropically. And I just think if we applied that same laser focus to how we are moving money in terms of investments um, and, and we continue to beat the drum for greater and greater transparency from companies and greater and greater transparencies from asset managers in the form of mutual fund managers, SMA managers, creators of exchange traded funds, et cetera, you know, that makes change. So it's not about like, well, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. We're working on a continuum. Um, and the more sophisticated everyone becomes in terms of un even just understanding that there are different ways to do this and there's sort of contested uh, understandings of it, I think it moves the ball forward. Um, question, if I don't want to vote my own proxies, but want to support shareholder advocacy, what is the strongest approach? Well, um, Amy, it somewhat depends on um, what you are invested in. So for example, um, you might be, let's say you're working with a financial advisor and that financial advisor has you in a portfolio of mutual funds. Um, I'll use that as an example. You can ask that advisor to investigate how that mutual fund manager has voted their proxies. That information is public, it must be public. So, and that advisor can get it. Now, um, <laughs> I don't like to critique my brethren, but they are mostly guys and they tend to be a little lazy. So you may have to press them, okay? I noted, Linda, that the big sea change came when you went from a he to a she. <laughs> well, um, no, advisory I, front. So <laughs> just saying, just no, I had, I had other, my original advisor was a woman. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, good. All right. Good. Sorry about that. Uh, but if you are owning, let's say you have, you're at a firm and they have chosen stocks for you, but they are voting the proxy mm -hmm. on your behalf. Again, you can say to them, tell me how you're voting your proxies. I want to see what guidelines are you following? Um, how did you vote on the last shareholder resolution that came up for XYZ company? So that's public, public information. Just by asking the question, you're advocating, I would argue. Um, would Maggie, you can't you also um, give your proxy vote to someone like As You So who can um, essentially like do it on your behalf in terms of more, I mean, I don't really know how that works, but isn't that an option too? You can, um, you can sign on to resolutions. What you can do is you can more give your seat at a shareholder meeting to an activist. We've done that with, um, we did that with corporate accountability where they had a particular action 
we don't own Coca-Cola in our portfolio, but we have clients who, being based in Atlanta, it will not surprise you that we have clients who own some Coke shares, right? Because grandma gave them to them and now they're never going to sell them. And so we had clients who actually gave their right to attend the shareholder meeting to activists from corporate accountability. Um, so um, that is another way. But again, you need to be an owner of the stock in a more direct way than you would be if it was in an exchange traded fund or a mutual fund or even an SMA, separately managed account, unless the advisor of the SMA themselves is in partnership with a nonprofit like as you sow and is reaching out for people to sign on. But it doesn't, doesn't usually pierce all the way through to the individual holder unless you are just owning it directly. Um, would you suggest looking over each individual stock with certain metrics to see if your fund is serving your goals? So on the fund side, um, you'll see that we put in the chat a link to um, a tool that as you so created a screening tool um, and it is at the fund level, it's the mutual fund level. So it's not going to pierce all the way through to an individual stock, but it's, you can look and see how your fund ranks relative to a variety of metrics. Um, to get the information about individual companies and what's really happening under the hood at an individual company is um, not easy. It requires, I mean, so, you know, like, we do this for a living in our firm and we use this, for example, some of the software I was just talking to you about, and it's, it's quite expensive, the database, because it's, co it's collecting data from, you know, all of these different sources to look at all of the different things the company may have been involved in, what's positive about it, what's negative about it, what, what, you know, suits have been brought against it. It's very, very complex. So the average investor, probably wouldn't want to spend the money to gain access to that software. If you are interested in checking it out, however, um, the, name of the, the name of this particular data analytics group is Your Stake. And it was developed by these two guys who were um, activists at Yale who were involved in getting Yale to divest from fossil fuels. And they were also data analytics wizards and they put together this software and they're rolling it out for use with registered investment advisory firms like ours. And we were, we're like, we, we're loving this stuff. I mean, we're just, we're, I'm, I'm like a kid in a candy store. I mean, it's really, really good, but it's, you know, I'm not sure if you happen to be on the call and you run your own, um, um, you know, maybe you have your own family office. It, I would definitely recommend looking at it. If you're, um, a garden variety millionaire and like, you know, just running your sort of other portfolio, you probably should ask your advisor about it. They may have access to it. Um, great. Just a plug for figure eight investment strategies, formerly with Trillium. Um, let's see, where are we time wise? Other questions from the audience or other comments from Linda, either you or Laura, advice for our membership on this journey. Well, I mean, for advice on the journey, I think, go, you know, I think some good advice is, and I appreciate you being here, is just going in to it with some type of knowledge about what your, you know, what your uh, options are. And, um, and picking the right advisor. I mean, I think that's really important too. And you know, you, you know, ask around, talk to people. Um, you know, I think those are those are all important. Interesting. I do hope, yeah. Go, Sorry, go. I was gonna say, I just do. I hope to get more involved as my kids get older, and I feel like I have more capacity for it. So, I. I, I intend to, but there's definitely ways that you can start to get involved with kind of very low time investment just by picking the right advisor. Um, Ellie asks, I know we're focused on portfolio investments, but I'd like to ask the mother about the uh, mother-daughter dynamic about legacy, perhaps a different session, but any comments about uh, from you guys about that for the good of the order? 
So, are, I mean, when you talk about legacy, are you asking like, what's in my will or what, I mean, what, I guess is the question. Maybe Laura knows. <laughs> Ellie, do you, yeah. Eleanor, do you want to come off of mute and maybe like say a little more about that? Uh, yes, I, you, you've got it, Linda. And it, it's, if it's a question that's uncomfortable, please don't, but I have three daughters and two grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel with all these questions, I'm working backwards. How much do I leave them? How much do mm -hmm. I family, how much, and they've been notified <laughs> that, that they may not get the entire legacy. So mm -hmm. it's a question with them, but I think um, seeing the two of you, and I thank you for being on this call, is I need others to how wrestle with a, a larger view of how we look at um, power shifting um, and what that really means. And I know that it does hit legacy. So I don't know if the two of you have talked about, you know, setting up trust for grandchildren, setting up trust for children. Right. Yeah. So Laura's my only daughter. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, we've, you know, I, I, I've, I've always, I've struggled with this a bit. Um, certainly my current uh, will, this Laura's included in it, but she's, um, but there are a lot of, there are other, family members that are included as well. <clears throat> and at this point we have designated a certain, I think it's at a percentage of what's remaining um, that goes into a um, whatever vehicle Laura wants to use to give money away. So a donor advised fund or a, um, if she wants to set up a foundation, we, we didn't set up a foundation. Um, and I'm really happy we didn't, we, we don't have the resources to have a huge, a large enough foundation that it makes sense to do that. And working with the donor adv advice fund has, has, um, has worked out really well for us. So, um, it's always a, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, we don't have anything set up for grandkids at this point. They're, um, seven and nine. Um, so it's probably pretty simple, but you know, a certain amount will go to Laura, a certain amount goes to other family members, and then we have this um, philanthropic piece. My mom and I are really lucky that we're super aligned on our values and, you know, that we're in WDN together and that uh, my mom has already given me some money in a donor advised fund so that I can participate more actively. So that's kind of like an easy, um, that's kind of been an easy way to kind of share legacy around that. But we don't have any expectations of any sort of receiving any more money from my parents. And if my mom wants to give all of it away, all of it away, I'm thrilled. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, mentioning the donor advised fund is a great segue to um, our closing, just to say that we are going to be talking about um, uh, donor advised funds and their use in some interesting ways to do direct investing uh, of course, as well as um, in publicly traded portfolios, um, environmental, social, or socially responsible investing. So that would be just one thing I'd leave you with. Don't forget to look under the hood in your own donor advised fund as to how the money is invested. Um, because mm -hmm. that sometimes gets, in some funds, it's just, um, it's a default to a, uh, you know, a group of indices that may or may not be, um, screened in any way that you would approve of. So just, you know, don't forget to take a look there because in a lot of cases, people are holding money in their donor advised fund, it's building up, it's not all going out the door, so it's being invested. So the question is, um, where has it, where, where, what is it doing when you're not looking? Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're kind of landed the ship right on time, Nirvana, um, to turn it over to you. I just want to say thank you for all the resources that people are putting in the chat. Um, and Nirvana will take it away. So thank you. And thank you, Linda and Laura. Yeah. Thank you much. Awesome. Thank you all for that really rich conversation and for everyone for chiming in with their own resources in the chat. I will be compiling a follow-up email with all of the resources that were shared. So look out for that coming your way soon. Um, I wanted to say thank you for Linda and Laura for being our guest panelists today. And of course, thank you to Maggie for hosting this super informative series. 
And the last thing that I'll say is that I hope that you all will, will join us for session three of our impact investing series. It's taking place on Wednesday, February 16th at the same time as this one. And we will be talking about impacting and investing through the lens of the private market from private equity all the way to venture capital. Um, our guest speakers for that call um, include WDN's very own Babby Jacobs, who I believe is on this call today. Um, and she's also the New York chapter president at Social Venture Circle. And then in addition to, to Babby, we also have Helena Hasselman, who is the managing director at Stardust Equity, which is actually a branch of the single family office of fellow WDN member Molly Gosham. So I hope to see you all at the next session in, in our series and look out for a follow-up email coming your way soon. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.